Good day, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the uh, 2020 edition of the International Viral Hepatitis Elimination Meeting. Um, uh, it's, it's great to get together again. This is the only international conference dedicated to the uh, global effort of eliminating viral hepatitis as a public health threat. Next slide, please. I'm Dr. John Ward. I'm the director of the Coalition for Global Hepatitis Elimination at the Task Force for Global Health in Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm joined by my uh, co-moderator uh, uh, today. So hi, everybody. This is Hubal Qureshi. And welcome to the International Viral Hepatitis Elimination Meeting of the 2020. Uh, I'm a gastroenterologist. And I'm the national focal point for hepatitis for Pakistan. Uh, the main theme for this meeting is uh, actually as to how to move the hepatitis agenda in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, and especially engaging children, pregnant mothers, and high-risk populations for testing and treatment. So all these issues shall be shared with you all by our, our experts. And I would like to thank you all for joining this meeting. Can I have the next slide? So, so uh, it's, it's a two days meeting. Uh, it starts from today, that is 4th of December and uh, tomorrow, that's 5th of December. And uh, each day it's a five hours uh, duration meeting. And uh, it starts from 1400 hours to 1900 hours, uh, the Central Europe time. Uh, and uh, you can come in between uh, the meetings uh, and you can uh, join in and also have the poster view between uh, 1800 to 1900 hours. Next slide. So for the networking, uh, we, we, we have the portal available and uh, uh, unfortunately, it, I can't see the full uh, picture. So uh maybe uh, somebody can help in that but the networking is also available and uh, this is uh, available and uh, one can do the networking uh, and have a one-to-one -one live call with the colleagues next slide we want to thank our sponsors um including one the ones listed here in particular uh, gilead sciences uh, and um um, and others. Next slide, please. We also want to thank uh, our endorsers, which are, you know, a large number of organizations that are all really working toward the main uh, objective, which is to eliminate viral hepatitis uh, transmission and mortality as a public health threat. Uh, and, and many of these organizations will be in the audience today and, um, and uh, participating as uh, presenters in, in uh, we thank uh, everyone that's uh, working together in this community of practice uh, toward our common goal of viral hepatitis elimination. Next slide, please. Also, we really encourage you to uh, provide some feedback. There will be a feedback option after every session to evaluate, you know, uh, what, uh, uh, you know, aspects of the, of the session that's very important for us to plan in the future, future meetings as to what people felt was really helpful for them. Um, and, and also what were areas of um, uh, improvement or, or information gaps that we could address um, in future conferences. So please uh, give us your feedback as we move forward. Thank you. Next slide, please. And last but not least is the group photo, which is very important, you all know. <laughs> so for this, we'll request you to please take a photograph of yourself and post it to Karen or to Ricky. And then they would put all these photographs together and make a big picture and post it to us so that we all are seen there. So thank you very much. And now may I request John Ward to please open the first session, please. Thank you. Thank you, Huma. Thank you. Move right into the uh, you know the first session uh, to really you know, uh, to really get going. Just want to um, thank everyone again for coming together. You know, uh, beginning on a journey toward disease elimination is not for the for the faint of heart. It takes a real uh, courage to seize on aspirational goals. It takes um, 
really a passion, a commitment, and, and persistence. And that's really particularly true for viral hepatitis, given the variety of modes of transmission and the nature of the disease, which is often silent until the very end stages and then develops very severe uh, end-stage liver disease, cirrhosis, and hepatocellular carcinoma, et cetera. You know, that said, over the last several decades, we've made remarkable progress in prevention that has reduced, modes of trans reduced the frequency of transmission through a variety of different modes, uh, as, and that has translated into life save, but we still have a long way uh, to go to reach uh, the elimination goals that have been set by WHO for 2030. Um, so we need to celebrate our achievements, but also recognize our challenges and then see how we can all work together to, uh, to continue our, uh, our accomplishments and success as we overcome um, these uh, challenges. Um, it's my a pleasure to um, you know, introduce uh, Dr. Meg Doherty, who is the director of the Global HIV, Hepatitis, and Sexually Transmitted Infections um, uh, Program at the World Health Organization. Uh, Meg has a, has a long and um, very illustrious uh, career um, in various aspects of HIV uh, prevention, uh, care, and treatment. Many of many of those uh, uh, accomplishments at the at WHO. Um, she received her medical training at Harvard, public health training at, at Johns Hopkins uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health. Um, so it's it's my pleasure to um, to introduce Meg, which we'll we'll we'll, we'll begin with her recorded remarks. And then she'll be available for discussion. And I really encourage everyone to um, to use the chat function to put in comments and questions as as you hear Meg's remarks, so we can capture some of the questions that you are having as we move through the program. And then there will be a discussion period uh, after her presentation um, uh, that will be followed by the, Dr. Jordan Fell's um, uh, presentation, and then we'll have a discussion. Uh, thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Meg Doherty and I'm really pleased to be able to join you today to speak about WHO efforts and the status of global elimination. In the next 15 minutes, I plan to make a case of why large-scale hepatitis screening diagnosis and treatment is the way that we can reach our hepatitis B and C elimination goals and targets. Today, I'll be talking about the rationale for acting now lessons learned from champion countries, measuring impact and program targets, and validation of elimination and the implications for countries. You know that viral hepatitis affects over 325 million people around the world. And for hepatitis B, 275 million people are living with hepatitis, primarily in Africa and the Western Pacific. However, we've seen very good reduction in cumulative incidence through the introduction of immunizations. In terms of hepatitis C, we have 71 million people infected in all regions with an incidence of 1.75 million new infections per year, linked mostly to unsafe healthcare and injection drug use, among other risk factors as well. However, unlike HIV, TB, and malaria, the mortality from hepatitis is increasing. And we've seen that this increase is rising as we have more infections, as it's a long term from infection to hepatocellular carcinoma. And we've seen 1.3 million deaths in 2015. All of these uh, indicators, prevalence, incidence, and mortality will be updated in 2021. In 2016, the World Health Assembly pledged to reach elimination. And under our global health sector strategy under WHO, we identified four, five core interventions that if we had sufficient coverage would lead to a decrease in incidence of 90% and a decrease in mortality of 65%. We know that 2020 is now essentially passed and we're really now working towards there are 2030 targets um, where we need to step up our game and really work towards elimination. In our global health sector strategy, we have to address both the testing and treatment, but also the prevention. What we need to attain is new infections of only 900,000 by 2030, 
and less than 500,000 deaths by 2030. And we need to address infant vaccination, mother to child transmission, blood safety and, and uh, injection safety, harm reduction, as well as the diagnosis and treatment. In our global health sector strategy, we've outlined a criteria by which we try to assess our accountability and how far and how well we've done in terms of reaching these targets. For prevention, we're doing fairly well with hepatitis B vaccination, blood safety and injection safety, doing very well in terms of targeting. But we need to do more in the hepatitis B mother to child transmission, harm reduction, and certainly in the diagnosis and treatment of hepatitis B and C, we have a long way to go. The success that we saw in June of 2020, where we were able to actually report on achieving the global target for 2020 of less than 1% hepatitis B surface antigen prevalence among children less than five years old. This success has been driven by immunization and birth dose immunization around the world, but has left behind Africa. And we need to really step that up. When we start to look at the 2030 target of less than 0.1% prevalence, we're seeing that we have a number, almost 51 countries that are really ready and candidates for potential validation of elimination. In terms of the cascade of care for hepatitis B infection, in 2016, the latest data that we have, we're way far behind our achieving our targets. And we have much to do for both the testing and treatment target. And, but we do know we've made some progress where we have 4.5 million people on treatment. And we hope when we do our updated data this year, we'll start to see an improvement in this area. There's been some missed opportunities where we haven't been able to use tenofovir as much as, much as we should be. In terms of the hepatitis C, well, again, we have far to go in terms of reaching our targets. However, we have made some successes where we have less than 200,000 people on direct DAAs or the direct antivirals. And now we have close to 5 million, but these are concentrated in our most uh, high burden champion countries. And we need to scale that up and get more countries available to be able to deliver treatment. On the accountability of our global health sector strategy, we've been asked by our director general to look at across these areas, how we're faring. We know we've developed global goods and guidelines. We've provided technical support. We've produced a price tag and that it would be cost effective to introduce these interventions. And now in 2020, we've been requested to develop criteria to validate the elimination. So the next piece, I'll be speaking a bit about that process. From countries, we've seen that we've been asked by and pushed by countries where we've seen excellent political leadership from Egypt, who are hoping to be eliminated within the next few years. We've seen Georgia taking the lead. We've seen countries like India introducing hepatitis programs into the domestic financing and UHC. Australia has shown a reduction in mortality already. And we have elimination plans from Africa, including hepatitis C elimination from Rwanda, as well as triple elimination starting across the continent and negotiations of prices in Brazil. And with that, we're starting to see that there are national plans and impact indicators showing improvement. As long as we have both the input and the outcome, we see the impact. But there are barriers. We have limited funding, lack of transparency, high cost in some countries, fragmented procurement, limited integration of testing, and certainly inefficiencies, and slow and limited product re uh, regulation. But we've seen the prices come way down. This is a slide from a Chai report. <clears throat> we're in Rwanda now. We're seeing a cost of a 12-week treatment down at $60 all in pricing. And we need to see that transparency across all countries, especially upper middle income countries, as well as we need to see the same level of transparency around pricing for the viral load, where the prices are ranging from 70 to $9. And that's just not acceptable for a diagnostic that we know we can run for less than $10. In terms of measuring impact and program targets, 
These were requested of WHO to come up with some global criteria, a framework, and a, government, a governance process for the validation of elimination as a public health threat. And we hope that this framework will be useful. It will motivate countries to take action. It will provide guidance on how they can do it in different contexts. And we will want to make use of all available data that are in the country currently. And during the meetings that we've had, uh, WHO convened meetings where we've looked at what are the criteria and how ready are countries, we can see that countries across the board have some variables and indicators ready to be measured and others that need to be developed. And certainly countries have more information around prevalence, incident cases, uh, data around five-year-old prevalence or under five-year-old prevalence, but few have real good data around mortality, liver cancer, registrations, and death. We also know, and we have been discussing, that some of our targeting, which is relative, may be difficult for some countries and easier for some countries, but it may not truly reflect elimination. So for example, a country that has very high burden, they could have a relative decline of 65% of mortality, but they still may have a very high burden of disease. Whereas another country, they may be able to make that decline, but uh, it, it's easier because they, they're on an older pathway of their disease. And uh, so we want to make it equitable across all countries. And using absolute targets may be the way forward. We also know that not all countries have access to all the information and that they have to develop either registries for mortality, registries that have attrib attributable fractions for hepatitis B and C as we move forward. What you see here is what are the proposed uh, framework and criteria for elimination. We have both have in the blue impact targets and programmatic targets. For hepatitis B EMTCT, we know that we can, can hold on to the less than one, excuse me, one, 0.1% uh, prevalence for less than five-year-olds. But it's also very important that we reach at least 90 or 95% coverage of A and C among mo mothers who are coming in. So we're treating both the child and the mother. In terms of hepatitis B and C as a public health threat in the general population, the incidence reduction is, needs to be greater in hepatitis B, but when we translate these into an overall absolute incidence in mortality, we combine these and note that for the incidence, we're looking towards a less than or equal five per hundred thousand per year and a mortality of less than five or six per 100,000 per year, which is re reflects that, that, absolute, that relative reduction. We also know that the mortality is much greater in hepatitis B. And so therefore, we want to be able to push these programs together. If they're doing very well on hepatitis C, that the programs also consider how can they push monitoring hepatitis B and achieving the same level of, of outcomes and impact for hepatitis B. We also want for hepatitis C to ensure that we have the prevention targets, unsafe injections, blood safety, 300 needles and syringes per person injecting drugs per year, as well as a birth dose vaccine, especially in Africa. For hepatitis B EMTCT, another area where we're looking is really at a path to elimination, as well as for general populations where countries who have such a high burden, it will take them many, many years to reach elimination. We would like to be able to provide them with interim targets to show that they're moving towards elimination. Already, since we had our first meeting around hep B elimination, we can see that we've had four regional validations committees developed in MRO, Euro, CIRO, and Wipro, and two regions have already started the process. So we know that this elimination of mother-to-child transmission is really within reach. So what will this mean for countries? We hope that the implementation considerations for elimination, having that framework on in hand, will help countries to think about strategic information and data quality, developing strong laboratory and medicines of quality, 
and pro ensuring that the programmatic implementation has high quality and is balanced and is not overly burdensome. But we need to maintain equity, human rights, gender equality, and community engagement in this work. In terms of governance for the EMTCT element for either dual or triple elimination, triple elimination being HIV, syphilis, and hepatitis, we already have a governance that has a national valid validation committee, a regional validation committee, and a global validation committee that advises the DG at WHO about making recommendations for certification. Most of the work is done at the country and the regional level. Similarly, for elimination of hepatitis B and C, as well as EM EMTCT, we're proposing a national, regional, and global level approach. This appears complex, but it's just giving you an indication that there's feedback within the system with the bulk of the work happening at the national and the regional level, with the global level really providing that um, recommendation to the DG to certify the validation of elimination. So what are the next steps on the road to 2030? We're going to be conducting country pilots of these criteria, of these, you know, they are proposed criteria for the validation of elimination. We'll review and update these critical elements for our global health sector strategy for 2022 to 2030. We're likely to want to develop new absolute targets for 2025, but that has to go through a process. We'll develop and expand country, regional, and global capacity to monitor our progress towards elimination. And certainly we want to help countries implement their programs and build on both building back from the COVID pandemic and look for opportunities that emerge from the response. Certainly in conclusion, elimination of hepatitis B, C, and PMTCT and mother to child transmission of B is within reach. And we just know what we need to do. And now is the time to make that public health push. So with this, I thank you very much for inviting me. I will stop here, thank you. Thank you, Meg. That was very informative and, and very uh, you know, revealing about this new concept of um, verification, the, the process of um, verifying progress toward uh, these elimination goals. It's, um, it's, you know, it's really a, it's a, it's, 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 it's a new, uh, it's a new element of um, development of a full-bodied hepatitis elimination uh, effort uh, at the global level uh, effort uh, level at WHO, um, and uh, and also this consideration of absolute versus relative targets. So those are very important uh, new concepts that uh, hopefully people will be thinking about and have some questions and comments about in our discussion period. Thanks again, Meg. Uh, let's turn now to uh, hear from uh, Dr. Jordan Feld, who's a hepatologist at the uh, Toronto General Hospital and then the McLaughlin Rotman uh, Center uh, for uh, Global Health. Um, Jordan is well known to, uh, I'm sure many of you um, in the audience, uh, he's, he's done uh, remarkable work um, in many phases of uh, hepatitis, both uh, basic research, clinical research, and then outreach into various community-based approaches to improve access to testing uh, care and treatment. Uh, he'll be uh, talking uh, about um, you know some of um, you know some of the progress we've made since we last met about a year ago, as well as some of the challenges and how we're facing those. So we'll um, we'll hear from Jordan uh, in a pre-recorded message, and then he'll be joining us in a discussion period shortly thereafter. Thank you. I'd like to thank Huma and John for the kind invitation. I'm gonna continue this opening session by talking about some key developments over the past year, which have strengthened our elimination efforts. And here are my disclosures, primarily in viral hepatitis uh, area of research. And so what I'm gonna talk about today is that we actually have seen some progress towards elimination despite COVID-19. So I think there's a lot of focus on how COVID-19 has derailed elimination efforts and it's certainly created some challenges, but I wanna highlight that we still have made progress over the past year in both hep C and B. In hep C, I'm gonna focus on screening diagnostics and treatment and spend most of my time there and then finish with hep B on some efforts in vaccination and treatment. 
So before I begin, I think it's important to recognize and to honor our three colleagues, Harvey Alter, Michael Houghton, and Charlie Rice, who had this monumental achievement this year of being awarded the Nobel Prize for their discovery of hepatitis C, and just remind ourselves that this really was the first step towards elimination. We couldn't be having the discussions we're having today until these uh, scientific achievements were made, but it's also important that we remember as, as a, a group in this field that we use this opportunity where the world is focused on hepatitis C and remembering the importance of this discovery. And we use this to try to strengthen and push forward our elimination efforts. So again, congratulations to my friends and colleagues and, um, and to all of us that we should use this as an opportunity. So let's look at some progress on the screening front. And I would highlight this recommendation by the US Preventative Services Task Force, where they moved from the previous baby boomer or birth cohort recommendation to recommend a screening, a one-time screening of all adults between ages 18 and 79 for hepatitis C. And I think this is a, a very important recommendation. It recognizes the fact that we really have two epidemics, uh, certainly in North America, of young people who inject drugs and and then of the older birth cohort or baby boomer population. Now, importantly, with baby boomer screening, it was effective, but perhaps not as effective as we had hoped. And clearly, uptake and the way we promote this recommendation and get it taken up by primary care providers is going to be critical to its success. Fortunately, we saw a similar recommendation from the CDC with also recommending adult screening, but they went a step further and made sure to highlight highlight that we can that we screen pregnant women and not just pregnancy recognizes that for many people at high risk of hepatitis C pregnancy may be their only contact with the healthcare system Good safety and efficacy. This certainly shouldn't be done yet outside of a clinical trial, but hopefully we'll see a move towards this that will both be safe and prevent a vertical transmission of hepatitis C, which continues around the world. And I would just highlight an abstract that was presented at the liver meeting last uh, a few weeks ago, showing that unfortunately screening of children after they're born to a hepatitis C infected woman is still very poor. So we need to get better on that front. Now, I would highlight this uh, um, I Foundation, the Clinton Health Action uh, Initiative, where they put out this hepatitis C market report. And this is a really useful document. If you haven't seen it, I would encourage you to take a look at it, which really is an overview of supply issues for both diagnostics and treatment fo focused on low and middle income countries. And they highlight some determinants, some benchmarks, and some minimization strategies for the costs of tests, both rapid diagnostic tests and PCR tests, as well as for the costs of treatment. And it's really quite useful. I'll show you some of the types of outputs. So this is an example looking at diagnostics. And what you see first on the right here are you see the variability in the price of a viral load or of a rapid diagnostic antibody test. And you can see in these low and middle income countries, high variability in the cost ranging from 19 to $70 for the same test. And similarly for a rapid diagnostic test from over $2 to down to 30 cents. Uh, remarkable when you consider that these are identical tests. So what they highlight is the importance of price vi visibility. What's actually going into that price? It's not all the cost of the test. This is just looking at the gene expert real-time PCR test, which is a point of care PCR test. And you can see that about $15 of this $21 comes from the price of the cartridge, but then you see these additional costs and these vary and there may be some room for negotiation to try to bring down these prices and make this more affordable, especially in places where people pay out of pocket for these tests. In addition, we can try to make our diagnostics more efficient. So this was a, a study that I mentioned last year that's now been published. And it's um, some work from our group using the OraQuick rapid diagnostic test. And what we showed is that people who are viremic, who have a current active hepatitis C infection, will test positive on the OraQuick faster than people who are not viremic, who have cleared infection, either from treatment or spontaneous clearance. And the important thing here is that of viremic individuals, everyone tested positive for an antibody within five minutes. That means that if someone's still not positive at five minutes, 
they may still test antibody positive, but they're not going to be viremic. And those people can be, they don't need to wait around for the end of the test. Similarly, if someone tests positive within five minutes or early, we don't need to wait 20 minutes to tell them the outcome of the, of the test. So this, first of all, speeds up our throughput, particularly in high volume settings, but it also decreases the amount of expensive HCV RNA testing that's required. And I would encourage you to consider using this. Um, importantly, this has not been validated with other rapid diagnostic tests. Now, the CHI report also talks about treatment, and just like diagnostics, they show that there is wide variability in the cost of therapy. Here you see the range in price of 12 weeks of sofosbuvir and decladosphere, and you can see in low and middle income countries ranging from over $1,300 in Vietnam down to $28 for the same regimen um, in these different countries. And why is this? Again, they break down the cost. So it's not just the cost of the drug, but what they show is these different uh, things that add up towards the total final price and highlighting that these, these may be variable and they may be negotiable. And they really point out that there's very significant differences in the in-country price markup. So you can see here in Vietnam and Cambodia, neighboring countries, a 234% uh, increase in the or markup in the price in Vietnam leads to a much higher price for the same treatment than in neighboring Cambodia with only a 59% uh, increase. So I think this is key that if we understand why the costs are high, that's gonna be the first step to bringing them down. And I applaud Chai for bringing all of these data to our attention. Now, they also advocate for a very simple approach to treatment. They say you should do a simple fibrosis assessment, take a medical history, including medications, and they say reserve genotyping for children where you might still use a genotype specific regimen, although this is going to become less frequent as well. And they recommend no genotyping, no on treatment HCV RNA measurement, no on treatment monitoring in those without cirrhosis. So, this is a nice simple paradigm. Well, are there actually evidence to support this? The good thing is that, that there are. Indeed, from the recent ASLD uh, liver meeting, we saw that uh, this study, the so-called MinMon study, looked at evaluating people in both high and low and middle income countries with a very simple approach. So people had no pretreatment genotyping. They were given 84 tablets of sofosbuvir and velpatosphere. They had no scheduled on-treatment clinic visits or labs done, and they had remote contact at week four and 22. And what you see is that almost everyone followed up with their remote remote contact, so very good adherence to this protocol. And then uh, impressively, almost all 400 people uh, followed up for SVR12, and they achieved a 95% SVR12 result, which is what we'd like to see, but impressive data to support a simplified approach. We had previously done, but now published, uh, this randomized trial evaluating a similar approach of a standard follow-up of monthly visits versus a simplified approach of no visits for glucaprovir pibrentosphere, the other pangenotypic widely used regimen. And that you can see that in per protocol, people did identically well, very high SVR rates, a slight drop off with the simplified approach by intention to treat. And this really just highlights that for people where adherence may be a concern, this, this approach may not be optimal, but it really does work for most people. And I think gives us the evidence to back up what uh, Chai and other guidelines are now recommending as simplified treatment strategies. And indeed, the ASLD guidelines, which were previously a 22-page document, shrunk to one page for simplified treatment and assessment um, uh, last year. And you can see that for people without cirrhosis and no prior DAA treatment, they can have a very simplified approach to treatment, a simple uh, fibrosis assessment using non-invasive tools, simple basic blood tests, rule out hepatitis B and HIV, look up drug interactions, and then treat with a pangenotypic regimen, so no genotyping required. Required, uh, minimal or no on treatment follow up required, and then a very simple uh, follow up for those at risk of ongoing infection. Easel goes even one step further, and you see again simplified treatment, no genotype or subtype, and a simple approach of soft vel or glucaprovir pibrenosphere for eight or 12 weeks. But they go even one step further and say that SVR12 is dispensable except in patients with high risk behaviors and in patients at risk of reinfection. Now, I would specifically highlight that also it's important to confirm cure in those with advanced fibrosis. They do make that point in the document, but not in this particular uh, recommendation. So this is nice to see that the guidelines are now in line with evidence supporting this simplified approach.
And this really follows, uh, was also supported by this study that was presented at the ASLD looking at, can you use SVR4 instead of SVR12? We know it's hard to bring people back three months after the end of treatment. And they show that SVR4 in, in dark blue versus SVR12 in light blue, really almost the same. But it's important to remember that if you have a 99% treatment success rate, then even before you start, you know that 99% of people don't really need that SVR12 because they're going to be cured. Um, it does suggest that you can probably say any post-treatment time is, uh, is a confirmation of cure is probably good enough. But the key point here is that you could probably follow EASL's guidelines and dispense with SVR12 confirmation, except in people with cirrhosis and those at risk of reinfection. And a nice study that came out earlier uh, this year at EASL, uh, I think gives us evidence for the concept of treatment as prevention, which is something we've been talking about for years, this idea that if you treat people and reduce transmission, there's a prevention benefit in addition to curing the individual. And this was a study uh, from the Spanish uh, prison system led by Joaquin Cabezas. And what they showed is they were already doing screening for a pretty good screening back in 2015, but they introduced treatment um, in uh, 2015. 16 and scaled it up to almost everybody being treatment treated by 2018. And what you see is that the prevalence quickly drops. And what's the real evidence of treatment as prevention is not only does the, the prevalence go down, but they see reduced incidence. So they're having this prevention benefit of preventing new infections by treating those who are already infected and very high SVR rates and actually led to a decreased um, mortality related to hep C in a very short time frame. So very impressive data. And they followed it up with this modeling study, which showed that the benefits were not just in the prison system itself, but in fact, 90% of the prevention benefits from this strategy were actually seen outside of the prison population. And this is important both for modeling and making the case to policymakers, but also for data collection to make sure we capture this more indirect benefit of treatment as prevention. In addition to showing so solid data, we always have to think about the costs. And I think this study from Jag Chatwal and his colleagues at Harvard looking at the cost and can we get, uh, what's the price threshold at which treatment actually not is not just cost effective, but cost saving. So cost effective, good value for your money, cost saving, you actually get back the money you spent on treatment by saving in downstream costs. And what they showed is that in um, low and middle income and in high income countries, you can get to cost saving within as little as five years if you can get the price of DAAs down low enough. And what they show is that in low income countries, pretty low, $64, but I showed you that with the Chai report, some countries are well below that high income countries higher. So clearly we still need some work to do to bring down the prices of these drugs. But the reality is we are in a scenario um, where we can get uh, the prices down to actually make this cost saving. It's not all good news. This is data from our province in Ontario, Canada, where we looked at over almost 40,000 people. And what we found is that late diagnosis continues to be a problem with hep C, with a significant proportion of people presenting within six months of either presenting with liver failure or liver cancer. And that really stayed flat over time. So we still need work to do on the screening front. And this is really critical if we're going to get these countries here shown for high income countries. These are data from Homi Razavi showing that most countries are still not on track for the 2030 elimination targets, but they do show that small changes can take a country that wasn't on track and put them on track. And what they showed in Sweden, removal of fibrosis restrictions, in Germany, introducing an active screening program, and in Canada, just getting better data, actually switched them from red to green. So we still have work to do, but some progress on this front. Finally, switching to Hep B, the, probably the most important thing this year was that Gavi that supports uh, childhood vaccination uh, supported introducing the birth dose in countries where it doesn't already exist. We know that only 43% of countries offer the birth dose universally. Sadly, Canada is not one of them. And in low-income countries, particularly Sub-Saharan Africa, that's very low. But Gavi will fund 50 countries starting this year um, to uh, cover the implementation costs of bringing in the birth dose. The countries will still cover the cost of the vaccine, which is fortunately pretty low.
And then finally on the hep B front is there is progress moving towards cure. So we have very effective treatment that can suppress but rarely cure the virus. And I think there's excitement in this area, but I think it's important to remember this isn't as easy as hep C. So be patient, but there's new therapies coming on a lot of different fronts. And I would hope within the next few years, we will have curative therapy for hep B, which will be another game changer. So to summarize, despite COVID-19 and its many setbacks, there has been progress towards elimination this past year on in hep C, new screening recommendations, diagnostic improvements and some cost containment efforts, as well as the useful report from CHAI, simplified treatment, both evidence for it and the guidelines supporting it, and on hep B, rolling out the birth dose and moving towards curative therapy. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, Jordan and, and Meg are now with us uh, live. They will start asking, uh, uh, answering some of the questions uh, from you uh, in the audience. I will, uh, you know, I'll kick it off to get things going. Uh, you know, Meg, you, you introduced this uh, a concept of a uh, verification of of, of uh, reaching elimination goals. Can you tell me a little bit more about that process? You mentioned piloting. You know, uh, have you identified some of the countries uh, where that piloting will happen? And tell us a little bit about the piloting process, please. Okay, well, thank you very much, John, and uh, to the organizers for having us on for this session. And certainly, yes, the process has been already a full year where we've started um, looking at how we might go about validating um, and setting criteria for validation. Now, many different elimination processes use words like verification, validation, and certification. In this process, we're using the term validation of elimination, and we have the criteria that we are developing and setting forth. So we've had a couple of meetings thus far. We've had a meeting in June and another meeting in November, where we've gone through the process of looking at the not only the targets that we have for 2030 or the goals that we're trying to achieve, but what would be the criteria both impact criteria, as well as programmatic criteria. And that was the slide that we put up for the proposed or draft criteria. So um, with that, we've had multiple consultations virtually to get people in, endorsing and, and thinking through this, a number of modeling projects, a number of data quality checks, and really trying to see if, if these um, in the criteria that we're proposing will be feasible. Since we've gotten through that process now in 2020, in 2021, we'll be moving forward with the piloting as mentioned to ensure that, that it really measures what we're hoping it will measure of elimination. So we have five or more countries who are sort of our champion countries who are now on the road pathway to be uh, uh, trying these criteria out. And certainly we already know that we have Egypt who's been our forerunner country would like to see if, the, if they can be validated for the elimination of hepatitis C. We have other countries such as Rwanda and certainly other countries lining up. Uh, and I don't have them all right now because we don't want to put them on the spot if they haven't accepted. Um, but we certainly have another set of other countries that would be um, wet, ready and willing to, to see if they can um, make the criteria, do they have the data and assess their systems? And certainly we are trying to have this um, finalized and shared broadly, globally, so that it can be used in other settings, certainly by the end of 2021, because we've already done quite a bit of work. And the goal now is to really help countries achieve that elimination. And as we saw from Jordan's presentation, um, maybe just small changes will help them achieve this. And so we'd like to be able to uh, measure that and also validate that and have the DG support and share that good news um, with their countries and with the member states. So thank you. Well, thank you. Um, you know, this addition of a uh, absolute uh, 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 together with a you know, relative Decrease as an elimination goal is a, you know, is a, you know, it's a pretty big change. Uh, you know, you you mentioned how you would you would like for you know these changes to motivate additional countries. So, you know, I see the current elimination goal. It's inherently a call to action. You know, it's like you know you need to reduce. You need to do something to make it better than where you are now. 
Uh, and, and then an absolute goal, I can see the, the value of that because you have a more, you have a firmer mark, but um, uh, it doesn't have that inherent call to action statement in it. Uh, so I just wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about the potential benefits that you see as to why an absolute um, uh, goal may be more attractive and motivating for a country versus the current goal. Well, I think when we first set out with our global health sector strategies in 2015, 2016, when they were developed, we really had very little global data to work on. So to have a strong baseline to which you can tag a absolute target was just impossible. So we really need to work on a relative target, a decrease of X percent, a decrease of Y percent. And that's really to, as you said, to a call to action motivation to say, we can handle, we can move forward, we can actually, you know, we can actually end hepatitis C if we take this seriously. And so um, I think as now we're more mature and we have baseline data and we will again, we're in the process right now of collecting data for 2021, which will show us where we've gone from the data that we had in 2015, 2016, to say, have we made significant progress? Once we have that, an, abs a, a, an absolute target helps countries to really say, uh, even if I decline the number of deaths or incidents by X percent, do I still, because I have a large burden of disease, do I still have a, a large pool of people who could be transmitting or people who need treatment? And so I think in terms of validation of elimination, we want to make sure that we're at the lowest number possible so that we are moving from sort of an epidemic scenario to an endemicity. And, and that's why we think a, an absolute will get us there to endemicity. Um, but that's the reason why we want to pilot to see if it's actually achievable. And so we, we will look forward to reporting back next time we're here next year. Excellent. Um, uh, Jordan, you raised a lot of um, you know, good issues about uh, this variability in cost, uh, particularly around you know, diagnostics and still to some degree around uh, therapy and, and some of the reasons for that you know, in, you know, within countries and the, and the variability of that. Um, but yet, you know, there are some countries that have been able to overcome those barriers. So I didn't you know if you wanted to comment on what, what have been some of those strategies to help some countries overcome those um, barriers that you um, mentioned. And I was going to uh, you know, turn it over to Meg and I invite her to comment on that as well from some of the, her experience in HIV, you know, who dealt obviously with large volume purchasing and uh, quality assurance around uh, testing and treatment. She may have some experience from, from, from HIV to offer, offer us. That's a good question, John, and it's an important point. And I, I think um, what's clearly critical here, is, there's a few things. The first thing is actually transparency about what the prices are. So it, that's, I think, one of the things that the Chai report does nicely is it breaks it down and shows you where are these inflations happening? Because in many countries, that's really an opaque question. The second thing then is really bulk buying. I mean, this is sort of, you know, the, it, it goes to almost anything, any commodity we buy, the Costco concept, but if you buy in bulk, you're gonna get a better price. And um, for countries, this really makes a huge difference. Um, whether buying from licensed generics or even unlicensed generics, but, um, and, and still I would encourage countries to try to be using WHO pre-qualified tests so that you make sure that your, your quality is good so that you're not just getting cheap, but you're getting cheap and good. Um, and then with high volume, ideally national purchasing, and then even I think within Sub-Saharan Africa, there's value in even multinational purchasing, the, the volumes, the more you increase the price. And I mean, clearly Egypt as, a, you know, as they've done with most things in elimination has led the charge here, but they have been able to bring down the price of even nucleic acid testing. So PCR testing down to remarkably low costs, um, which allows, uh, really allows you to expand your diagnostic reach. I think it's also important to think about the tests you're using and make sure that you use the right test in the right place. So sometimes there is this sort of temptation to want to use a new fancy uh, shiny new test, but really you want to make sure that you reserve your rapid diagnostic tests for scenarios where you need them. If ser serology in your hospital is cheaper, 
and you have people coming into the hospital anyway, don't, don't spend your money there on a rapid diagnostic test. So I think being careful and thoughtful about where you implement the right test makes sense. And then I, I think if you do this really at a collective level, I mean, I guess the other real important point is governments have to step in here because in many countries, uh, the diagnostics are paid out of pocket uh, by people and they're, they're done in private diagnostic labs. And so we know that for many people, this will really significantly outpace the cost of therapy, which is kind of crazy. To be diagnosed with the disease is costing more than to cure it. Um, but a lot of that is really to do I don't want to say that these are bad characters. These are folks that are trying to make a trying to make a living, but they are. It is a bit of price gouging, and so if there is regulation within the country to make sure that it's reasonable to have some markup, and everyone's got to make some 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 profit on what they're doing, but you can still keep the prices down dramatically because the cost of the cost of manufacturing of these uh, tests now has come so low that you can still make everyone in the chain make what they need to make and still provide these tests at an affordable price. Thank you. No, I think that right, what's the right mix of testing uh, in a country is really important. That's one of our technical assistance objectives. We'll work in several countries, you know, in that regard, because uh, it's not always point of care. It could be a mix. It could be lab based only just because of the various um, um, aspects of your health system. Indeed, we were talking with one African country and they were remarking that they, their central laboratory charges $18 for the H hepatitis B PCR and $12 for the HIV PCR just because of the negotiations around the HIV price for the HIV program and also differences in volume, et cetera. So that's what really got me thinking, you know, relevant to our discussion right now to turn it over to Meg to see if she has any experience you would like to share from HIV that would be helpful here. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And I probably would just reiterate what Jordan just said. It's it's definitely about volume. It's definitely about having an approach either across um, countries, across regions. Some of the places where we've done, we've looked a bit at the public health approach for HIV. And what's important is that there are generics, a number of manufacturers that are willing to do this at a lower price in the market. So it's about the market shaping as well. And for drugs, we need at least five generic per, you know, out there who can be able to provide the drug at a price. And you get enough competition that you can get this to the price that's actually you know, going to be at a public health level where governments who are either dependent on donors to support their program or are looking at their own health infrastructure and health financing that they can make this work for a large number of people. The challenge with diagnostics, as Jordan was mentioning, there are a lot of hidden prices that, and price gouging that happens that are not standardized. It doesn't have the same sort of system of regulation because it's a pipette here, uh, you know, uh, another piece there that you know, adds up over time. And I think certainly with the PCRs and the kind of infrastructure that's been developed for viral load, PC, you know, viral load PCRs for HIV and now for HPV, people do want to go to the, um, you know, let's say the new shiny point of care, but you don't need to. So if a country who has a very well established centralized lab, you know, the, the, the greater investment might be on a transport system or identifying if you can do this with the same level of quality on a dry blood spot, you know, really looking and, and thinking about the lab networking and optimizing that. Lastly, I would say, you know, hepatitis is in a different situation because they don't have a large donor like the Global Fund or PEPFAR supporting hepatitis, but they can potentially tap into the pool procurement approaches and see how they can maximize some of their buying power by coming together. And so, um, that would be a very good way to sort of set this up because buying power, pushing the market down, will get this, get it to a point that we can actually have real countries that have financial difficulties moving forward in the elimination space. So I think there's a lot to learn from HIV in many ways for hepatitis. And there's going to be vice versa as soon as hepatitis is able to eliminate people in the HIV world will say, well, how come we can't? <laughs> and 
And I think that's a, that's an important thing that we need to like share those yeah. lessons learned. Oh, ab no, absolutely. Uh, I look forward to that day when they're fully jealous of a hep hepatitis. Ep uh, that's Amen to that. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> You know, and quickly, I mean, I think what we've all we've gone over is the, uh, you know, we have the care models, you know, there's some examples of success uh, for financing. Uh, and it really, uh, you know, we have the models from Jag Chatwall, et cetera. And it's really, you know, it's an opportunity, you know, it's really a reminder of the importance of what I always call local champions who are really, you know, put all this together. It could be coming from civil society, clinicians, uh, ministries of health or perhaps a, hopefully a whole coalition really making that powerful case to the country so that action happens. And I just want to applaud all the local champions around the world that's making that happen in, in, the, in the countries. And um, so thank you again for that. And thank you, Meg and Jordan, for your presentations and for your discussion today. So we'll turn it, thank you again. Uh, we'll turn it over to session two uh, and uh, I'll turn it over to Huma.